Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study and continuing where we've been working in Daniel 11 and trying to put uh, 23 and 24 on a present truth line, trying to get that interpretation uh, cleared up. But anyway, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here into this study this morning. We're so grateful uh, for each of the people who are searching and studying and trying to understand the present truth. And we need your Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us, to teach us. We pray for one another and um, we pray for this study, that the things that we learn um, will be beneficial to us and those around us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so yesterday we were uh, sorting through some things that we uh, we hadn't particularly sorted through before. I mean, we had discussed it before. And, and that had to do with, and I'm just trying to get like the document here. Um, so it had to do with he shall become strong with the small people. So that's the last thing we were looking at. Now, we're, g- we're going to go back and, of course, cover some of the things that we also talked about. Did anybody give thought to this yesterday? I'm having to look at the structure of what, what we're addressing here. Now, yeah. in, in the way that we have been, we've been going through this, we have been using a lot of what Uriah Smith had had to say and the other party that, that you've been bringing up, um, Swearingen. Swearingen, yes. Is Swearingen doing much the same as Smith did in setting aside William Miller's rules? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I think they're both trying to follow Miller's rules, but I don't think they set them aside. Uh, the only thing with, uh, with Uriah Smith, is he depends a lot upon what other people have said, which would be a departure from Miller's rules, but he's not like totally departing from them. Um, I mean, we look at commentaries and stuff as well. I mean, we look at Swearingen and we look at Uriah Smith and we look at others. And, and when you look at Swearingen, his approach actually is pretty similar to ours. I mean, he goes through all, a lot of the same chapters in order before he deals with Daniel chapter 11 he goes through, you know, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel 8, uh, Daniel 9. He goes through Revelation uh, 12, 13, and 17. I believe he goes through all of those and some other things as well. So, I mean, he's trying to bring everything together. So I don't think that I would place upon Swearingen or even Uriah Smith the problem that they They aren't following Miller's rules. I would think the problem more lies in the time in which uh, Uriah Smith was writing and also swearing in just the fact that he doesn't know some of the things we know. But I I think they're both trying to do the best that they can. Well, But, But Smith does have a dependence upon commentators, right, commentaries and and. And I don't think he's trying to ever look at something in a fresh way. I think that's another problem with Smith. Is he, he's always trying to stick with what is known, which is not a bad thing in some ways, but he never really questions things. He never, he never digs very deep. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would say that's a problem. And obviously there's certain places where He's obviously not following Miller's rules. I mean, when it comes to um, dealing with uh, the king of the north in Daniel 11, verse 40, he's definitely, you know, by applying the literal uh, king of the north and king of the south there makes no sense. And people still do that. So I don't I don't think the problem necessarily we have to, you know, say the Rye Smith is like this big problem. Overall, what he's interpreted in Daniel 11 is pretty solid. But there are things that he that he doesn't seem to understand 
And, and particularly one has to do with the use of pronouns, which I think almost no one understands when it comes to reading Hebrew. People always just say, well, it says he must be the, pre the previous person referred to. In English, yes. In Hebrew, no. So, I mean, that's that's the only point we're addressing here. Why he says, um, uh, and after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. Well, it's not really clear who the him is and who the he is. Okay, so that that's that's my main point. My question has a different aspect. The time in which Smith initially was presenting his ideas on Daniel 11. Mm -hmm. James White was yet alive. Was yeah, I understand. But the what? only place they differed on, they didn't, wouldn't have differed on any of these parts here. They only differed on the latter part. So James White would have agreed with these interpretations of Daniel 11 we're looking at right now. He would have agreed with them. He wouldn't have had some major issue. It was just when you dealt with the king of the north that was, you know, dealing with, you know, 36 and onward. I believe yesterday in our conversations, we were addressing that 11.6 has a tie in with this and also is dealing with both the king of the north and the king of the south. So my point mm -hmm. is Smith attempting to relate these passages in a literal fashion. But you would take them in a literal fashion. Because we're not we're dealing with, uh, I mean, you're trying to say here, so the question is, when does the king of the north uh, change from literal to spiritual? Because it is going to be literal at the beginning, but it changes to spiritual. And the question is, well, when does that occur? We should all know that. Haven't we agreed that that was going to occur somewhere between 1989 and 2001? No. Okay. No, I, no. So, uh, when, okay, when we deal with Babylon, is Babylon in the book of Daniel literal? No. Yeah, it is. When it's talking about Babylon, it's talking about Babylon, literal Babylon. Not, not in Daniel 11, because by the time of Daniel 11, Babylon will have passed from the scene. Yeah, but we're, yeah, Babylon's not in Daniel. So the, the question is, uh, when do we move from literal Babylon to spiritual Babylon? Because literal Babylon is, is in the book of Daniel, right? When it's talking about Babylon, it's not talking about some spiritual thing. It's talking about the kingdom of Babylon. It's literal. And then it's going to move to spiritual Babylon. So when does that occur? Well, if it's not from 1989 to 2001, then we would be talking about somewhere before that, like 538. Yeah, yeah so 538. Why 538? Because then the papacy comes on the scene. Okay, right. So the papacy is spiritual Babylon, and we also mark a cross there, right? Okay. 30 years and then the cross. 508 to 538. So prior to that, we're dealing with literal, little literal Rome, and then we move to spiritual Rome. And, and if we're talking about the king of the north and the king of the south, well, the king of the north is still literal prior to 538. So, so when we're dealing with pagan Rome, Pagan Rome is the king of the north because it 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 has the territory of the king of the north. Can we agree with that? That's why it becomes the king of the north. There we're using prophecy to take a look at history, and so I would have to agree. Right. But but when it move when when Rome moves from pagan Rome to papal Rome, you know, if we were going to take a verse in Daniel where we move from literal to spiritual, Daniel chapter 11. Where would that verse be? Where do we move from the literal to the spiritual? What about Daniel 11:31? So when we move from pagan paganism, the daily, to papalism, have we moved from literal 
to spiritual because that's 538, right? The taking away the daily is 508, but the setting up of the abomination of desolation. So, so the mistake that Uriah Smith makes and the pioneers, some of them made when they were addressing the king of the north in verse 36 is they are saying because it's the, you know, we have to look at the territory. That's what marks the king of the north. But we know that, that France is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. It's not literally Sodom and it's not literally Egypt, right? To be Egypt, it doesn't have to be the king of the south. France to be the king of the south doesn't mean that it has to hold the territory of the king of the south. Right. For the papacy to be the king of the north doesn't mean it has to occupy the territory, the literal territory of the king of the north. The USSR does not have to uh, have the territory of the king of the north to be or the king of the south to be the king of the south. Right. The United States doesn't have to to be the king of the north. Right. So that change there is where we have the change from literal to spiritual. So we can't we can't change it anywhere else. All of that before, when we're talking about the king of the north being Rome here, it's because it occupies that territory. That's true in the earlier part of, of chapter 11. But once we get to the papacy, that's not the condition for the papacy to be the king of the north. It has to inherit the characteristics of Rome. Right now, that's going to happen in a sense a bit gradually, because in order for that to occur, we have to remember what it says in Revelation chapter 13. So in Revelation chapter 13, it says, um, uh, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet, as it were, the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. So this power, seat, and great authority are three um, characteristics that have to be passed from Rome to Papal Rome, right? We know that the dragon primarily represents uh, Satan, but in a secondary sense represents um, a paganism, right? So, so we know that the dragon is Satan, but it represents paganism. And paganism is going to give his power seat and great authority to papalism. And when it does that, then the papacy becomes the king of the north. The papacy isn't the king of the north prior to that. It has to have these three attributes in order to be the king of the north. So any thoughts on that? I had to step out just briefly before you made your request on, on any thoughts. Okay. Well, any thoughts on the idea that the the power seat and great authority being passed from paganism to papalism is the giving over of the daily to the transgression of desolation, right? That's where we move from literal to spiritual. So the king of the north prior to that is still pagan Rome. And then when the papacy gets its power seat and great authority, that's when the daily is taken away and the setting up or the giving of the abomination of desolation, because that word set up in Daniel chapter, chapter 11, verse uh, 31, is actually the word natan, which is uh, means gift, right? So when it says set up, it's... Uh, um, were actually placed in, in, in Daniel 11, uh, 31. It says, and they shall place the abomination of death that maketh desolate. That word is Natan. And then in Daniel chapter 12, uh, verse 11, they use the word set up. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, again, that word set up is Natan. It shall be 1,290 days. So even though it's the same wording, they translate it differently in both verses. But anyway, 
It's when the daily is taken away and the abomination that make it desolate is set up that we move from literal to spiritual. So we can then talk about spiritual Babylon, right? Spiritual Babylon is the papacy from 538 onward. Um, in a sense, we, we could say it's from 538 to 1798. And then Babylon expands or breaks into three parts of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet in that history from 1798 to 1844, if we wanted to be more particular, right? So we know that, that the city of Babylon has three parts, but it, it doesn't have three parts during the 1260, right? The papacy is, is Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. But after 1798 to 1844, we now have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet false prophet developing in the Millerite history, the dragon power coming in when it uh, takes the Pope captive of France. Um, but they all still exist. And, and so there's this division of Babylon that occurs, spiritual Babylon, right? Is that, is that making sense to people? Because we went through this when we were studying, um, what's the name of the study called? Um, Examining the foundation. So when we went through Jeff's writings and we went through the daily, uh, we addressed it then. I believe that's when we addressed it because that's where we looked at uh, the pioneer view of Daniel chapter 11. And we found that it was indeed um, the same view that Uriah Smith had. So Uriah Smith didn't come up with the idea that uh, the king of the north uh, is is Turkey and the king of the south is Egypt and France is the third power in Daniel chapter 11. That was the pioneer view. So he he's trying to stick to the pioneer view. James White has a new view that isn't the view of the pioneers. Okay. All right. We're in in this in this situation. I'd always come to the understanding that James White was more of a defender of Miller's rules and that Uriah Smith was setting Miller's rules aside. Hmm. Especially. Well, I, I don't think so. I, I don't personally hold that view. I think that, uh, that there is, he, he doesn't follow Miller's rules, but neither did the Millerites follow Miller's rules in, in a lot of the conclusions that they came to. Uh, we, when we examined what they understood about Daniel 11, for instance, they basically just used Alexander Keith. And, and that would have been, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Charles Fitch and Josiah Litch. Uh, I think it's mostly Josiah Litch. He's just going to be following Alexander Keith on what he says about uh, a lot of things in prophecy. And, and Uriah Smith is then sticking to, to the pioneer view of Daniel chapter 11. Now you can't say it's completely the pioneer view because different people had different views on Daniel 11, but it was the predominant view that um, when France, uh, you know, takes the Pope captive, France is not the King of the South. That wasn't the view, but that's James White's view. And James White's view is a later view. So it's, but you know, the question is, is one following Miller's rules more than the other on particular points? Definitely James White. His, his basic argument is we always have the final power being the papacy. And now you're going to have it be Turkey. And, and he just couldn't accept that, that because each, each line of prophecy always ends with the papacy. Now you're having it end with this battle about Turkey, you know, Turkey fighting Egypt. Where's, where's the papacy there? Right. And, and those and the views of Uriah Smith did not pan out. What he predicted with Turkey did not occur. So, I mean, I've been having this discussion with people on Facebook for, you know, the last year or so. But they, they want to stick with what the pioneers say, which which we can't on this on this point. But th this sort of takes us away from here. So the problem with Uriah Smith here, the, I don't see any particular problem with what Smith is doing with these verses. But when it comes to this small people, 
you know, we have to, we have to decide how to understand this. So, cause this is this Roman league and, and what Uriah Smith is going to say at this time, the Romans were a small people and began to work deceitfully or with cunning as the word signifies. But from this time, they rose steadily and rapidly to the height of power. So, um, you know, the question is, is Rome a small people at this time? I mean, is, is that what it's talking about? They shall become numerous with a small people. I mean, he could be right, but we're not going to just assume that he's right here. So how are we going to solve this problem with this interpretation of this verse? You know, most people are going to apply it to, you know, lots of different situations. Like this, here in Daniel chapter 11, when you start getting into these verses, there starts to be a lot of difference. Okay, so if it says, um, and after the league, made with him. So who does it say is making the league with who? Because it could, it should be normally um, that after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, right? Okay, so is this, since we're looking and we're, we're using the male pronoun, mm-hmm. is this to denote a group? Is this to denote a civil group or is this to denote something else right so so they are uh plural uh or not plural singular uh male pronouns he and him they're not plural they're singular so, but it's, it's not showing this as a singular party as a singular person correct well I mean, after the league, so, you know, so if you look at a league, it's like an agreement after the agreement, right? Because it's not covenant, right? It's just the league and agreement, coalition or something made with him. So, so there's somebody making the league with him. It doesn't, it doesn't say who's making the league with him. And, but then it says he shall work deceitfully. Now, is it the him that works deceitfully? Or the one who makes the league with him that works deceitfully, right? It, it, it's obscure here. It's not really clear. So how do we apply this in, in using Miller's rules? Well, we compare scripture with scripture. So we, you, what you did is you looked at other places where we had leagues, right? Correct. Okay. And, and you looked at this number particularly 2266. Correct. And that brought you to... Um, well, Daniel 11, verse 6, right? Correct. And and what was the other one? What we were just talking about in 22. Now, there's there was another place. Where was the other place? Uh, Hosea 4.17. Yeah, so Hosea 4.17. Yeah, Ephraim is joined, so it's the word joined, to, to idols, let him alone. Mm-hmm. Correct. Drink their their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom. So we have that uh, five four nine three and for sour. And there was something about that. I'm trying to remember because we know the children had eaten sour grapes, or the fathers had eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. We have that and. Was the other one? Yeah, so I think primarily it was this Hosea, Hosea one. Uh, another thing, it, well, Genesis fourteen verse three, right? So it's going to be the first time the word shows up. So this is going to be this battle with um, Kedeleomer, right? Oh. So it says it came to pass in Genesis fourteen verse one in the days of Am Raphael. The king of Shinar, Ariel, king of Eliezer, uh, Kedaleomer, king of Elam, Tidal, or Tidal, king of the nations, that these made war with Barak, king of Sodom, with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemabur, king of Zeboim. There's a the king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together. So that, that word joined together is that word that's translated league in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. 
and 12 years they served KDLA Omer, and in the 13th year they rebelled. And in the 14th year they then came KDLA Omer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Imans in Shava, Kirithaim. Right, so there's going to be this this battle of the kings, right? Now, how many uh, kings are there? I was trying to remember the number one, two, three. five. Yeah, so there's five that are all together with that league with K, right. and and then they're going to make battle against one, two, three. Five kings. So altogether, there's ten kings in this battle, right? So five against five. And then, so when it says these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea, I mean, they're not in league together. I mean, you actually have two different groups fighting against each other. They're going to use the word joined together. Um, or are they joined? No. Again, this, this is a league. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I understand this. This doesn't make sense. So they're going to have a war, and then they join together. Is that what it's saying? And I thought I knew this better than this. I thought they were joining together to go to war. Well, it says that these five kings are going to make war with these other five kings. That's what it says. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't understand that before. Unless they maybe they're just going to war together. Maybe that's – so this made war with – um, I need to, because I always thought that there was ten kings, and that represents the world. That's the United Nations. Okay, I'm just reading here quickly. Yeah. So what it's saying is all these five kings align themselves together with for war, right? So that's the idea: is that they're um, all these the five kings allied themselves together and came with their forces into the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. That is to say which was changed into the Salt Sea, the destruction of cities. Okay, so I'm not sure I totally understand this this story. But yet we have a tie-in within this portion with the king of the north and the king of the south. King of the south? Well, where you have the king of the north, don't you generally have a king of the south? Well, generally, but I don't see the king of the south here in this section. In 23 and 24, it's not addressing the king of the south at all. I was speaking about this out of Genesis. Oh, in Genesis. Oh, yeah, I don't know that there's a king of the south here. This isn't a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south either. I just um, I just want to know more about this, this battle. So there's says there's nine kings, most people say. So I always thought it was... Five versus five, five and five. Okay. Um, in, in first, in the, in the first verse, I see four kings. In the first verse is four kings. Um, oh, king, that's of, how I'm king, of, king of Eva. Oh, yes, you're right. There's four. So there's four kings. Okay, and then there's five in the next section. Okay. Yeah. Is Abraham counted as one of the kings? No. But Abraham would then represent the tenth participant group. Yeah, but that wouldn't help with our symbol. Because I just thought that there was ten and that represented the world, Abraham. Um, and anyway, Abraham's going to come and, um, you know, once Lot is taken captive, he's going to come and fight and get Lot back. So I wouldn't put it, he's not a part of that battle of Battle of Siddim, it's called sometimes. Okay, so anyway, there. When it says they were joined together, the thing that I'm trying to figure out is: are, are they? Is this referring to a league? So it says all of these were joined together, right? In the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Kid and Leomer, right? Um, and thirteenth year they rebelled, and the fourteenth year came Kid and Leomer and the kings that were with him. So there's going to be nine kings coming. Okay, I went out the king of Sodom. Okay, so it's going to be kind of interesting too. In verse 13, and it says, There came one that escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, 
uh, the Amorite, uh, brother of Eshkol and brother Vayner, that these were confederate and these were confederate with Abram. Now that word confederate is two different words in Hebrew. One is says master of the covenant. So you have Beret, Berit, however you want to say it. And then uh, the word master, Baal, so which is Baal, right? But but that's the words that are used, Baal, Berit, to say they were confederate with Abram. So so in a sense, we have two different um, groups. I mean, we have these nine kings that are going to come because of this rebellion that occurs. And still not sure I understand this. I always thought I knew this story. Hmm. <clears throat> anyway, that's where we first get the word uh, that's translated league. Kabar is in 14 verse 3. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? So, so we're, we're trying to follow Miller's rules. We're looking at two, two, six, six, that Hebrew number. And we're looking at the places where it shows up. So, you know, Ephraim being joined to his idols, joined to idols. And, and so the idea here that, um, we had, um, look, lots of times it's referring to machinery and so forth. You know, it's used in Ezekiel 1, 11, 1, 9, uh, to refer to the wheels within wheels and, and how they're constructed. Um, it's a lot of times used in, in that sense. Um, and obviously in Daniel 11, verse 6, they shall join themselves together at the end of years, right? And when we addressed this, addressed the end of years, that phrase, uh, that Hebrew phrase is two Hebrew numbers, uh, 7093 and 8141, which gave us 15,234. And what we did with that number is we counted back from April 5th, 2030. And I can't see anything on the black screen. Yeah, I know. You, you oh. can't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I did that backwards. Okay. Yeah, just because I got that, uh, get rid of that. Yeah, it brought us somewhere. I'm trying to remember exactly where. Well, I don't know. I uh, can't remember now. We had some place where we put this. I guess I added it wrong. I think we might have added it wrong. No, I don't remember now. Okay. Anyway, forget about that. I, I can't remember what we did with, um, with that. It must be in one of our charts. Frustrating. Okay. Let's go back here. So we were dealing with this way back here. Um, don't remember. 8141-7093. <clears throat> Anybody remember what we did with that? So I thought we did something with it, but I just don't see what we did. The end of years. I know we used years, but I thought we did something with 7093. Sorry, I'm taking up all this time. Let's see what we did with it here. Anyway, so yeah, I was thinking of the other one dealing with April 5th, 2030. In the end of years. For years, did we use 6256 as in times? Yeah, we used times, but I'm just, I thought we did something with the word end. Uh, I mean, we have the there 8141 that's going to be the number of days from um september 11th 2001 to december 25th 2023 but i just thought we had something to deal with the end the 7093 but anyway it's it's kind of uh i'll figure it out at some other point right now it's not that important the 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 main thing is that we have this joining together so in daniel 11 verse 6 at the end of year. So we're saying that this has to do with September 11th and they shall join themselves together. So that's going to be the same word that we're, and we're applying Daniel 11, 6 to 9, 11, right? And we're taking this um, in, so I'll go back here, right? So there's the Daniel 11 verse 6, 
in the end of years, they shall join themselves together, right? So this is this leak that's going to happen, and it's going to be typified in our history with 9-11. So when we get here, and after the leak made with him, he shall work deceitfully, um, we're applying this to 9-11 as well, right? So there's a consistency there. It It's... Um, Ephraim's joined to his idols. Now we say that Ephraim refers to um, the Pro- Protestant America, right? And uh, we're saying that this is 9-11, not 1989, because that 9-11 is when we have spiritual formation come in. But then when it, so when it comes to applying this after the league made with him, he, so so we could say after the Jews made a league with him, Rome, he, Rome, worked deceitfully. Is that how we would understand this? So remember when we went to verse 22, we had these arms of a flood. They shall be overflown from before him. This is referring to what's going to happen uh, in the persecution of the Jews. Right. It's a type of the Sunday laws addressing the destruction of Jerusalem and be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. So Christ is going to be crucified. So this is Daniel chapter nine, verse 26 and 27, dealing with the crucifixion of Christ in the midst of the week and the destruction of Jerusalem. Both are here in this verse. That's how we understood this. Now, it's then going to go back. Right. So it's going to go back in time here. It's in the time of Tiberius and afterwards to the time of Titus with the destruction of Jerusalem. Right. But in Tiberius is when Christ is crucified. Titus is going to be the one who destroys Jerusalem. And then it goes back after the league made with him. So is this talking about the Jews making a league with Rome? Is that what is that what it's saying? It would seem to be. Okay, so that seems to make the most sense. So the league is made with with him being made with Rome. And that makes sense because it's not a plural. If it was a plural, it would refer to God's people. But here it's a singular masculine pronoun. And then it says, he shall work deceitfully. So that him and the he are the same ones in this context. And then it says, for he shall come up and shall be numerous with a small people, okay? So the question was, when it says he shall come up, is that again Rome? Rome pagan or Rome papal? Or are you saying Rome in general? Just Rome. Papal Rome is not yet until verse 31. I mean, it's pagan Rome. I don't have a direct answer. My mind is blank. Okay. So... So I would say the he the he that comes up is Rome. So all these masculine pronouns are referring to Rome. So that means the ones who make the league with Rome are the Jews. Now then when it says, and shall become strong or numerous with a small people, is that small people the Romans themselves or is, is it the Jews that are a small people? Now, we, we had this discussion a while back when we first looked at this. Um, you know, and Stephen was saying, well, you know, the Romans never became numerous in Jerusalem, in, in, in Judea. If you're going to say they become numerous with the small people, you would have to say, well, if the Romans are just a few Romans who come in, do they grow in number? So so who this small people is, I think, is, is going to be pretty important. Now, the word people is goi. It's a singular Goyim means the nations, right? The Gentiles are referred to as Goyim. This is just Goy, it's singular. And then this word small means a little or few, can also mean almost, some, very few. Um, Could be another word for for remnant, remnant or something? Well, I I don't know if I'd put it as a remnant. Now, if we look at, you know, this word, the first time it shows up is in Genesis 18. Verse four so far. Yeah. So Genesis 18, as little, let a little water, I pray you be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Right. So just means some, right? Just get some water, right? You know, Jacob says the years of my pilgrimage 
are few in the days of the years of my pilgrimage. They're few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. Okay. So I'm just not sure why. The question that I have just has to do, what is this talking about? He shall become numerous with the small people. There has to be some way that we can apply this and why it's there. Right. That's that's sort of my point, because we can just pass these by and say, well, you know, you know, it, it, it's not really telling us much. It just it becomes numerous with the small people. But what specifically is this referring to? So this has there has to be symbols attached to this. OK, so what else can we do with this word small? So what does Hebrew four, five, nine, two? have to do with what we're dealing with right now well that's what i'm trying to figure out i'm trying to figure out this is span of time there's some other way to understand this i mean half of it is 2296 it would be nice if it was you know 2266 because then we'd have something that would tie in with the league there just must be something about this i mean i just don't know what it would be well we got the word strong as well so I don't, I don't have a good answer. I just know there has to be something there with this small people. And and I can't, can't really find anything. Can't, can't see anything in, in uh, concordance matches yeah. up. Match up yeah, I don't find anything. I mean, the only time you have, but, but you know, it's a different Hebrew word, you know, small and great. That's a um, different kind of idea. All people, both small and great. So it's this word uh, itself, it's looking at other verses with that word in it. Well, there's Isaiah 10, verse 7, which is, of course, a symbol, the 10th day of the seventh month. It says, how be it, um, he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is his, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off uh, nations. That word nations is the same word, but it's plural. Uh, not a few, right? So it has the two Hebrew words there. Um, but it's not a few, right? So it's refer referring to ones that are obviously, that's a rhetorical sort of phrase to mean many. And of course, this small is also coming up in 1134, Daniel 1134. Yeah. Yeah. When it talks about, um, now when they shall fall, they shall be hope, hoping with a, a little help. But I'm trying to find like small people together, like a few people. It's like, obviously, if I type in small people, you know, few people well, help if I actually. I tried little people. <laughs> I can find nothing there. Yeah. So in Nehemiah 7, verse 4, the city was large and great, but the people were few therein and the houses were not builded. So you got a few people there together. Except it's a different word, people. It's not goyim. It's just uh, the, the other word uh, that's translated people, which is am. Um, like, you know, ami, my people, lo ami, not my people. I know I'm, I'm kind of stuck on this, but it just seems to me that there's something that, that, that I don't understand here, right? So when I don't understand something, now it says he shall become strong with the small people. I don't really know what that means. But he shall who exactly is the small? Yes, who exactly is the small people, right? Right. Well, who is the small people? But he also he becomes numerous because that word strong is numerous with the small people. So he becomes numerous with the small people. And is that true of Rome? I mean, either way I try to to apply it, it, it doesn't really make any sense to me in just the context of history. Now they have it translated as strong, but you know it and it could be but the but the word um here atsam means to bind fast that is to close the eyes and transitively to be causatively make powerful or numerous right denominatively from 6106 to crunch the bones break the bones close be great be increased wax mighty right so with the brown driver's brakes, you know, they just say it means to be vast or numerous. Now, that's 
the different forms of the word, right? So if, if I look up this, this word um, in the verse, it's in, um, so it looks like it's just in the call form. Let me just see. It's yeah, it's the call perfect third person masculine singular. So in that context, in that form, you can't just translate it however you want. Uh, you have to take to be mighty or to be numerous. So it wouldn't have anything to do with closing or shutting the eyes, right? Because that's a different form. Well, you could have a call to shut the eyes, but it, it will usually refer to the eyes themselves. Um, and the hifl form just means to make strong. So he's not going to make my, make strong a small people. He's not going to make a small people mighty. He shall become strong or someone shall become strong with a small people. Okay. So, <clears throat> I mean, we could just leave it for now, but it just bothers me that I can't, I can't, I, can't, I don't know why it's there because we think about it. So Rome has this league with the Jews, right? And he's going to work deceitfully. And then it says, for he shall come up. Now, now what about this come up? What would this be? Like, could this be referring to the siege? Gaining, gaining strength. Well, okay. So the word itself means to go up. Gaining, the... gaining notoriety or something like that. Well, yeah. So the word means to go up, ascend, or climb. If it's in the call form, it means to go up, ascend, to meet, follow, visit, depart, withdraw, retreat. Uh, go up, come up of animals to spring up, grow, shoot forth of vegetation, to go up, go over, rise of natural phenomenon. So floods could go up, to come up before God, to go up, go over, extend the boundary. So it's used in all different kinds of ways. Uh, to be taken up or brought up, that's the niffle form. The hiffle form uh, means to bring up, right, to cause, to ascend. So it's just causative. And then the hopeful means it's reflexive to be carried away, to be taken into. And then um, the hithpa'al, so to lift oneself up. Okay, so if we look at this word, maybe this will help us a little bit. So 5927 um, occurs in, uh, it usually means like went. So Allah just means to, there went up a mist from to rise up, to go, to come. So it's really, really common word. Gat, it's translated as gat. Okay. So it is in the Cal third perfect masculine singular, to go up. And perfect just means it's in the complete tense. So things are either complete or incomplete. So it's completed, which doesn't mean anything in prophecy. Because that doesn't mean that it has happened because they use the completed tense for prophecy. So when they say, and shall become strong, actually in Hebrew, it should say, and he be, he was, he became numerous, not he shall become. But because it's Hebrew, even though it's in the perfect sense, you write it in the imperfect. Um, and that's because it's prophecy. So they're taking it, they're already interpreting it in the sense that for you. So he shall come up, shall become strong. So shall come up, he actually has come up and has become strong in the Hebrew. It's perfect, not imperfect. Okay. <clears throat> but anyway, so 5927. So could this be referring to the siege? Well, we're going to have the siege later, right? The destruction of Jerusalem. So the way that I would normally take this is that this is just referred to the fact that they make a league. There's this deceitfulness that occurs. He comes up, that is Rome, and is going to become mighty or numerous. Now, maybe maybe we'd use it in a sense more of mighty. Now, then the idea with the small people, so is the small people Rome or is the small people the Jews? How would we decide? We've looked at small people. We didn't get a lot of help in comparing Scripture with Scripture. Uh, H1 one four seven one refers to non Jews. Yeah, goy just means nation, right? So I so, don't think it would be referring to Jews in that case. It's got, got to be Gentiles. 
Yeah, well, that's what, yeah, so that's what we said before. It generally refers to Gentiles, like a foreign nation, and it's also a Gentile. Right? So we would say that this small people must be the Romans, possibly, right? The question is, why, why does it have to say this? I guess, you know, just the way my brain works when we're studying here, it's, it's giving us information that we need to know, right? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so nobody really says what this means. Like, nobody pays attention to it. It's just kind of like, well, it's just something that's said, right? We we focus upon the league and the working deceitfully. But then we have to say, well, what is this coming up and becoming numerous or mighty with the small people? Why is it here? Because it must represent something. Like, obviously, historically, it occurs, but it must refer to something here. Now, we had this question about, you know, is it remnant? Or, but it's the goy, right? So goy generally refers to the nation, a nation here. But this is a small nation. So and, it, and reminds me of, of eight, it reminds me of 8-9 where it says, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great. Like it's a gradual enlarging expansion there. Okay, so this is just referring to to Rome growing from this little horn. So, so if it's referring to being strong with a small people, I mean, I wouldn't say that Rome is a small people at this time. I mean, obviously, it's not the world empire that it later becomes. They cover the, they have the three geographical areas at this time. Well, in in 161, in 150, um, like after that time, probably. You know, and then he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, right? So, so we know that this, and then he's going to do that which his fathers have not done, or his father's fathers. Now, that's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So, could we put this as the siege in 63? I guess is the question. Because we were looking at the siege in 63. So, in 63 BC, you have the siege of Jerusalem. With Pompey, so I think I, I'm sorry that I take so long sometimes. This is how I think, right? I don't, I don't just accept things right away. They, they have to all fit together. So, um, so let's look at it this way. We got this chart that we did, and so we have the league. They shall come up with the small people, right? That's going to be Pompey's siege. So that must be what it is. Now, as far as historically, so I don't know what the forces were, you know, how many people came against Jerusalem, trying to see if there's any information on, on the size of the army. So it says, okay, the death of Hasmonean queen, Alexandra Salome, plunged Judea into civil war between her two sons, Hyrcanus and Aristobulus. In the return of the promise for territorial concessions, Eretus provided Hyrcanus with 50,000 soldiers and their joint forces besieged all Aristobulus in Jerusalem. So I don't know if you would say that that's a small people. What if it's a small nation? I don't know. Could, could we say Rome in 161 is a small nation? I guess in the context of a world empire. No, I would think that Rome had come onto the ascendancy about 30 years before that. Yeah, I know. But it's still not this huge, uh, I mean, maybe it's referring to its origins as a small nation. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's reminiscing back. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, reminiscing back. So, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people or a small nation. So, even though they were a small nation, they're going to become numerous. So I'm still not 100% decided on it. Okay, so if we add the two, 1471 and 4592, that gets, we get 6063, which I've already been looking at that number uh, during these studies here. Um, and 6063 is like something like um, 16 years and 219 days or whatever. Six, 16 years and 219 days. 
Now, entering upon the fattest places of the province is the next thing, and which would really refer to um, not Pharsalus or the Battle of Actium particularly or anything, just to its its eventual takeover of that area. Right? It's going to destroy Jerusalem, and then it's going to refer to those even for a time. But well, I guess I'm, you know I'm somewhat satisfied. I think we could look at this as back retrospectively that Rome uh, becomes numerous or mighty with a small people, initially a small people, not necessarily a small people at that time. We could also look at it, um, well, let's look at it from the perspective of the Jews themselves. So the Jews, I mean, is there lots of Roman citizens in Jerusalem, you know, at the time they make this league? Would the Jews have recognized Rome, I mean, they would recognize them as this power, the military power, which is why they make the league with them. But eventually, and, and, but I don't see, see that Rome, you know, like lots of Romans move into Jerusalem or into Judea and live there. I mean, obviously you have, you have soldiers, you have, um, you know, different people who are going to be in the area. I know I'm taking so long on all this, but, <clears throat> but I, I think well, we can't say come up would refer to the siege. Okay, you had a comment? No, I was just saying these, these small issues are important as we've seen in the mm-hmm. past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's I mean, that's why we're spending the time looking at this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, we have, I'm just going to see it was 6063 as a word is, is uh, I don't know what that is. Somebody's name. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. So if we add small people together, right, that is four, five, nine, two, and one, four, seven, one, we get a verse that we looked at earlier. And we were looking at this verse in connection with, uh, two, two, six, six, right? That is, we went to 14 verse three and we had joined together in the veil of Siddim, right? And then we ended up looking at, um, this this verse 13 because it has the word confederate and and this also has 66063 which is the addition of uh small people together now this is the person that escaped and told abram the hebrew now where do we find a person that escaped that comes and gives a message from destruction so we have we have one that escaped in the book of ezekiel Right. He's going to tell Ezekiel that he saw the destruction of Jerusalem, the escapee. So is there any symbolism? We also know the, the escape, those that escape from the hand of the papacy. In Daniel 11, verse 40, whichever verse it is, 42, 43, I can't remember, 44, maybe. There's going to be those that escape. So we so we can connect this escape. Fugitive. It's going to be the same uh, as in Ezekiel, the same word. The escaped, the escapee, the refugee, and we're going to have it in in 42. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Now, it uses two words, and of course, it's um, just a variation of the 6412, right? The escape, those that have escaped, sometimes translated as a remnant. And, and then it also has this word. Uh, 1961 Haya, which just means they became escaped. So they, they escaped. It's just the word that's usually translated as came, come, had, have, been, become, become escaped. So, so you have that. So, and then we have, uh, yeah, and then you had another word escape, escape out of his hand. That's verse 41. But these shall escape out of his hand. So you have, some that escape and some that don't escape, right? Now, this word escape is a different one, a lot. It means they kind of are slippery. And that one, to slip away, escape, deliver, save, be delivered. So it's a different escape. But we still we still relate these together. So we got these escapes. We're going to have to come back to this on Sunday and try to settle this. I know we didn't really get very far today, but we did the best we could. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray.
Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love. And uh, we ask that you can continue uh, to work in our lives. We ask that you can teach us and bring us together again to study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.